Ooh. All right, let's go ahead and get uh, our meeting started. Welcome everybody to everyone who is here in Zoom and uh, watching live on Facebook and hello to future YouTube watchers as well. Uh, welcome to the Texas Normal August 2022 uh, general open meeting. As uh, many of you here know, we used to hold these first Wednesday of the month at 8 p.m. Uh, and we still do. We used to hold at the same time. We used to hold them downtown at Flamingo Cantina. And someday we may be able to return to some sense of normalcy in life and be able to, to go back there for now. And for tonight, we're here. We appreciate you being here. Um, my name is Jamie Spencer. I'm legal counsel for Texas Normal, and some of you have already gathered that that means we are doing some form of an Ask a Lawyer night, and we certainly are. Uh, we love to have your participation in these. Um, I'm about to introduce my guest, um, but we love to take breaks from the topics that we have prepared for you to answer specific questions either on the subject of tonight or anything about marijuana law or something that's happened to you or one of your friends or a question you have about the criminal justice system, especially as it relates to the war on drugs and the war on marijuana users. Um, but please feel free to uh, comment in any place that you can make comments. Uh, we're fortunate enough now at Texas Normal that we have people working behind the scenes. Um, and we certainly have that tonight. And uh, those people will be helping me gather up all of those questions from there. So I just really want to encourage you. For the, those that do remember Flamingo, I used to walk around with a yellow pad and a pen before the meeting and pass out several yellow pads and they would come up here. One of the real advantages of us doing it electronically is it has made it easier uh, for our members and for people who aren't members but are just here because they're interested in joining the movement and finding out what is the current state of the law and, and how close are we to making it better. Questions from any of those angles are really welcome tonight. We appreciate you being here. All right, so uh, many of you also know my guest, Paul Quincy, who has been a, a speaker here in the past as well. I thank you for doing that. Um, Paul, have you done one of the Zoom meetings? You've done one of the Zoom meetings, and then I know you've done Flamingo too. Is that uh, is that right? No, I haven't seen y'all since. Oh, so. it's 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 Paul's first Zoom back. meeting. So, um, Paul Quincy graduated from UT Law in two thousand one with an emphasis in criminal law and a certificate in dispute resolution. In two thousand six, he opened his private practice devoted to clearing the names of the unjustly accused by expunging and sealing criminal records. Since 2018, he has served as a reference attorney at the Travis County Law Library and now works there full time assisting pro se petitioners to clear their good names. Uh, to be clear, pro se petitioners means people that aren't able to hire a lawyer, they're doing it themselves. And, and the topic of tonight is going to be on Paul's uh, expertise, uh, which is uh, motions for non disclosure and expunctions. And they actually are very uh, complicated. Um, so it's good if you can if you can't afford a lawyer to completely do it for you. I really applaud Travis County for putting that out there as a resource for its citizens. Um, Paul also is the founding pro bono partner of the University of Texas Law Expunction Program, which trains law students how to help lower income people overcome the stigma of a criminal record. We're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, he serves on the steering committee of the Austin Lawyers Guild, which offers legal support to progressive activists in Central Texas. Um, and uh, if you want to see him and or me, because it's a place that I like to eat as well, uh, sometimes uh, I get to have a nice lunch with him at his uh, favorite restaurant, El Caribos, somewhere around uh, 51st in Lamar. So it's so a small percentage chance, but you can see us there as well. At any rate, welcome, uh, Paul. I appreciate your being here tonight. Um, so again, we're going to be talking about uh, mostly two remedies that some people have after they've been arrested and charged with a possession of marijuana, or really this is going to be true for a lot of types of offenses, Sometimes there are little tweaks in terms of time periods for certain offenses that we're talking about, but in terms of talking about misdemeanor drug cases and probably for the most part felony drug cases, uh, we don't really have to get too much in the weeds on that. Um, 
So I want to first talk a little bit about something that Texas lawyers have been confusing their clients about since before I got my bar card in 1997. It didn't take me six months uh, of practice in criminal defense uh, before I started realizing I was getting calls from folks who were saying, you know, my lawyer told me X, Y, Z, and now I don't really feel like that's what's happening to me. What's the issue? What can we do to help the situation? So really what we're talking about here is how much can you hide or completely erase the fact that you were arrested depending on how your case was disposed of? So the first thing we need to talk about is probation. Um, probation got to be a dirty word, and I think somewhere in the 1990s, uh, they uh, removed the, or might have been the 80s, they removed uh, the word probation from the code, Texas Code of Criminal Procedure and uh, replaced it with the much fancier community supervision. But if you were being ordered to be on community supervision, that is the probation that people know that we're talking about. Those sorts of probations mean um, okay, uh, you're not going to county jail, or if it's a felony, you're not going to prison, but you have to report into us monthly. We're going to take you A's. That's going to be true uh, most of the time, whether it's a drug case or not, by the way. Um, you have to uh, jump through all these hoops. You have to do, if it's a felony, it can be hundreds of hours of, of community service. Uh, the maximum probation for a misdemeanor is two years of probation. The maximum for what's called a state jail felony is five years. And with THC and our crazy THC laws, it's pretty easy to get into the third or second degree range on felony charges in Texas. Uh, so those probations can last up to 10 years and also come with really extra onerous uh, provisions. The thing that a lot of people were almost intentionally misled about, I think, was the difference between two different types of probation. One's called deferred adjudication probation and the other one's called regular probation. But for years now, I've been calling it regular conviction probation because I think that's a much better word to try to explain uh, what the real difference is. So, in a probation scenario, if my client is going to uh, enter into a plea bargain where he's agreed to do X, Y, Z on probation and they'll, you know, maybe they're dismissing other cases or whatever sorts of benefits he might be getting from that, we're going to fill out some paperwork. Uh, in a lot of places, my client would only have the option of pleading guilty. In some, you can plead no contest, but don't let your lawyer fool you that that's going to do you a ton of good off topic uh, advice realistically, that doesn't help you much. Uh, so don't let a lawyer brag to you about how fantastic that is for you. And we turn in that paperwork and we walk up in front of the judge. In a regular conviction probation situation, at some point during the judge's spiel, he's going to say, okay, you're standing here in front of me and you're telling me you're guilty. And I believe you because you've signed the paperwork and I've asked your lawyer, you know, do you does the lawyer think you're competent? Do you know what you're doing? Has he been properly advised? And all of those sorts of things. So I'm going to accept your guilty plea. And I am going to find you guilty. I am going to convict you of possession of marijuana. But instead of putting you in the county jail or in a felony, instead of putting you in state jail or prison, I'm going to put you on probation. You're going to jump through all of these hoops, okay? So you go to probation for... I mean, if it's a 10 year probation, you go 120 times. And that's how many times you've got to tell your, your boss you've got to take off. Uh, and you may have to take off to do other things as well. That's not the only uh, type of freedom you lose when you go on probation. But you heard right there, the judge said, you're telling me you're guilty. I believe you. And uh, I'm going to find you guilty. And here's your punishment. Okay, that's regular probation. Deferred adjudication probation is strictly mathematically better than conviction probation because there's one bad thing that it has that the other one doesn't, but it, it's only one fewer thing. You're still going to probation every month. 
you're still reporting in, you're still giving P tests, they can still send you back to court and jail if you don't follow the rules. All of that's gonna be the same, but deferred adjudication probation, to defer means to postpone, to adjudicate is our fancy legal word meaning finding you guilty. When we turn in the paperwork then, in the judge's spiel to you, he says, you're standing here in front of me. You've said that you're guilty. I believe that you're guilty. And I make a finding. This is going to be important later. I make a finding that there is sufficient evidence just from you being here. The lawyer saying you're competent. Everything we normally do. There is enough of a reason that I'm going to go ahead and find that the evidence supports the idea that yes, there's enough here to show actual guilt, but I'm gonna postpone finding you guilty. The actual words he probably says is, I'm gonna put you on deferred adjudication. And then if you jump through all those same loops of probation, technically you're never convicted. So that's one huge bonus, okay? It's definitely better because technically you can answer that you don't have a conviction. And because you don't, like if it's a felony and you successfully complete it, it's not going to affect your voting rights, those sorts of things. There's a lot of things that come about being a convicted felon or sometimes even being convicted of a misdemeanor offense that's higher than a traffic ticket. So all of those things are good. Um, but deferred adjudication, probation, the statute, there's some things in the statute that allow what I consider to be a little bit Weasley lawyers to start. I'm talking about the defense lawyers now. Uh, potentially, uh, to sort of either imply or outright state to their client that the case is dismissed at the end of it. And I understand that there's some technical legal language that I could show you from the Code of Criminal Procedure that would, that would justify me saying that, that I could say that it wasn't false. But the falsity comes from the fact that that's a lawyer who knows the Code of Criminal Procedure. When you're talking for you know you're talking to a client that thinks a dismissal means what everybody thinks a dismissal means. And it's really not the same as a dismissal, as we'll see. Now, there are other types of resolutions that can lead to other types of, of, uh, uh, of uh, remedies for you. And we'll get to those in a little bit, but I wanna pull Paul into the conversation and first, uh, you know, if you have uh, additional thoughts on sort of that difference between the deferred adjudication versus what I'm calling the regular conviction probation, and maybe more importantly, you know, imagine I, I know you've had this call, Paul. We've talked about this call. We've all had this call. I'm going to pretend that I was represented uh, by a different lawyer who basically told me that my case was dismissed because I successfully complete if I successfully completed the deferred. So I went ahead and I agreed to it. Then I successfully did everything I want. And now I'm calling you and I'm saying, hey man, my my understanding of this whole thing was it wasn't going to come up and bite me in the ass. But I'm having problems in apartments. I'm having problems with background checks. I'm having to explain this stuff. I thought this stuff was going away. Paul. You want to guesstimate how many times you've had that call, and then why don't you talk about, uh, uh, you know, what you would tell that client in terms of what his options are at this point? I got to say, I get at least five times a week people think saying that my case was dismissed. I thought it wasn't going to be on my record. My lawyer told me it wasn't going to be on my record. The judge told me it wasn't going to be on my record when I entered the plea. So uh, what Jamie's talking about with deferred adjudication, probation, that kind of a dismissal, it does technically say dismissal in the language that releases you from probation. But a dismissal with any kind of probation is not the kind of thing that can be expunged in terms of uh, getting the, completely off your record. So I want to talk about the two different ways that you do, that you uh, make public records non-public. So remember, we've always heard about our, our permanent record, like Violent Femme says, I hope you know this is going down on your permanent record. Well, any government records, uh, subject to several exceptions, are public records. And the only way you can make criminal records non-public is either by the processes of expunction or non-disclosure. So expunction is where the record is completely destroyed, even out of law enforcement systems. And, uh, and you can deny that you were ever arrested or charged with it. 
Um, yeah, the other one is uh, non-disclosure, which is going to play into what uh, Jamie was talking about, about deferred adjudication. Non-disclosure is where the records are intact. They're still, they still exist. They're still available to law enforcement, but they're sealed from the general public. So uh, the general public includes pretty much everyone except for the exceptions that are in the statute, which are pretty expensive. Um, any kind of a state agency or county or municipal uh, looking for employment uh, in any of those governmental agencies, uh, they can still see the law enforcement records. Uh, pretty much every licensing board in the state of Texas, uh, even though the records are sealed, uh, the licensing board can still have access to it. And, uh, and there are certain industries like a hospital, look working at any kind of hospital or school or school district, uh, they can still see that sealed information as well. So again, all this stuff stays public and that's why people come to see me because they've had these records sometimes for, you know, I'm getting calls now that someone's had a job for 20, 30 years and they either uh, did a random background check or we're going for a promotion and this thing all of a sudden pops up because in the past, the information sharing between the counties and the Department of Public Safety, which is the state police and also the clearinghouse for all the criminal history information in the state. Uh, the information sharing was not always great in the past, but now they're getting caught up on it. And so things that have never come up on a background check before are now unfortunately uh, preventing people from things like jobs, housing. Uh, my understanding is Tinder has uh, like a, some kind of option where you can run a background check on your date. So you can't even get a date uh, with, a, with a criminal record. Um, so what we were talking about with uh, deferred adjudication, so deferred adjudication probation, even though it can't be expunged, most deferred adjudication cases are eligible to be sealed. Um, that is with uh, like exceptions for like real nasty things like uh, murder, kidnapping, stalking, and certain other uh, family violence uh, related charges. Um, those kind of things are, are not able to be sealed, but pretty much any other deferred adjudication uh, that someone completes successfully, where, whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor, can be sealed. So that is a, a definite benefit of uh, doing a deferred over a straight probation. Okay, yeah, and Paul, I should have uh, picked up my pen earlier because you brought up at least three things that I thought were such great points that I wanted to talk about. By the time you got to the third one, I realized that I wasn't going to keep them all in my head. The first one that I do remember is uh, in your description of the call, I described a call where I said the client said my former lawyer told me, but you added something super important. And this used to happen in Travis County as well. And I remember there was one judge that kind of did it more than others. At any rate, you, you talked about the client saying, the judge told me it was going to be dismissed. And I remember uh, when I was at the criminal defense clinic as a law student at University of Texas Law School, that one of the supervising uh, attorneys there, one of the real guys that knew what he was doing so that we law students didn't screw things up too much, told me that, uh, you know, basically deferred adjudication is sort of this conspiracy between the judge and the prosecutor and the Weasley defense lawyer that doesn't want to properly advise the client so that they can take the money, not work, and, 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 and you know, not have to, you know, I, I want to sell this to this client as it being a good deal. I don't want to do any more work on this case. If I keep pushing back and, and fighting, you know, setting it for jury trial in a lot of places, they just can't try possession of marijuana cases because they have more important stuff. To, if, even if it's a misdemeanor, DWIs, assaults, those get tried all the time, right? Just having it there. But you know what? I really don't want to do that. So I'm going to pitch this to my client. And, you know, when the judges kind of get involved and also saying, you know, and yay, it's a dismissal, it's kind of echoing this, this, from a non-legalistic standpoint, it, it, it's, I think all three parties, I think the defense lawyer, the prosecutor, and the judge should realize this person in front of me didn't go to law school, and they have an idea in their head of what a dismissal means, and it's, and it's in any rate. So I thought that was a great point about uh, the judge. 
uh, and uh, you know, wouldn't surprise me if I'd heard. Uh, I think you know, Paul. I'm going to throw one other in there. This may not affect your client because a lot of times it's not going to happen until after the plea. But sometimes your client will do the probation paperwork with the uh, probation officer up there before you're turning in the paperwork. And I think I've heard you know probation officers tell the probation or when the, somebody else's client is over there or whatever, oh, your, jo your, job, your lawyer did a really great job for you. Deferred adjudication is a really good deal. I mean, I don't think those things should be said at all. I mean, that person doesn't know anything about the case anyway. I mean, maybe there was a much better deal to be had. But yeah, that's kind of a pet peeve of ours in terms of, I, I think it's really important that, yes, as a criminal defense lawyer, sometimes... 90% of my job is explaining to the client why we're getting such a raw deal. Of course, I don't agree with these laws and all those sorts of things, but man, it absolutely requires me to tell them everything that I know in terms of them being able to make a decision uh, about maybe if they maybe if they knew it wasn't really dismissed, maybe they would feel better setting it for trial, even, even potentially going to trial. I believe that there are many people who are in a situation where, um, you know, uh, a deferred adjudication probation and a regular probation are, uh, despite even the motion for non-disclosure possibilities, um, in terms of the effect it's going to have on their immediate life and how it's going to be seen over the next couple of years before they get to any remedy, for some people, when you explain it to them, they're like, you know what, Jamie, it is... Uh, uh, it, it, it's it's worth it for me to take this risk to try to go for the total not guilty. Now, speaking of not guilty, since they can lead to that, um, uh, let me change the question that the client's asking a little bit. Uh, and this is usually, in my experience, there's a lot less lawyer deception going on here. Uh, but the client calls and says, hey, my case was dismissed. Somebody else represented me. My case was dismissed. What's the deal? Well, um, I, I'm, I'm still having problems with it popping up on all of these places. I thought it was going to go away sort of, you know, on its own and all of those sorts of things. Um, Paul, you want to talk about uh, the remedies that uh, that person has? Yeah, sure. So like I was saying before, all criminal records are public unless you do something to make them non-public. And so if you were arrested and your case was completely dismissed without any kind of probation or you're arrested, and a lot of times, sometimes they just don't file charges. You don't get indicted or they decide they're just going to reject the charges on that case. Uh, that happens increasingly uh, frequently here in Travis County, where we have much more reasonable prosecutors who are rejecting pretty much every personal use dope case. Um, and, uh, and so the charges get rejected, so they don't even get, uh, so you haven't even been charged with it, but you still got this arrest record. So that situation, uh, may, you're, you'd be eligible to expunge the case, which is having those records completely destroyed. Now, <clears throat> one of the big uh, problems on, uh, on getting an expunction is technically you have to wait until the statute of limitations expires before you can get the expunction. So on a misdemeanor, statute of limitations is two years. And on a felony, for most felonies, it's three years, especially uh, dope cases. Um, so you have to wait out that time. So a lot of times people, you know, people go on with their lives. They forget that they even had this, uh, this arrest record because there were no charges on it. They weren't proven guilty in a court of law. So how can it be used against them? Well, come to find out the arrest records are still public and sold to all the background check companies. And so the, but the, on the expunction, the judge would order that every agency that has generated or received any information about it has to destroy those records. Uh, they also order DPS to notify every private background check company that's purchased the information from them. That they uh, that they can't publish it anymore, and it also uh, orders DPS to uh, notify the FBI. And of course, the FBI doesn't have to abide by some state judge's ruling, but they do have an agreement with the states that they get the criminal information from. That uh, that when they get a request for to expunge it, uh, they do take it off of at least your NCIC National Crime Information Center uh, rap sheet, like your your federal uh, arrest record. That does not mean that the FBI forgot you were arrested. The FBI never forgets. 
But in terms of what's going to show up on a background check, uh, what's going to show up on your official criminal record from the FBI or the state, uh, once the case has been expunged, that information should not show up for anybody. Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, again, more great points that I did at least get a pen out for this time if you saw me uh, scribbling some stuff down. You know, you had uh, uh, before that also at some point talked about the hospital worker um, or, you know, I mean, uh, CNA, uh, nurses, uh, all sorts of hospital workers have licensing requirements and all those sorts of things. So kind of backtracking to that that uh, or combining these two ideas together, that's the type of person when I sit down with them, uh, it may be that in their specific licensing situation, I mean, the deferred adjudication, uh, it, again, causes them so much harm right now uh, that it really does make a difference that, that they can feel better. I mean, sometimes I've had to talk people out of deferred adjudication. I'm sure you have too, Paul, um, where, you know, you get what you think is an unreasonable offer or at least something where you're absolutely certain, man, we can drag this thing out for another three to six months. I think it's probably going to get better, and, but uh, there's no, there's not a realistic chance that it's going to get worse in terms of an offer if we, you know, push back on this a little bit. So I wanted to say that about your comment about the hospital workers, because that's a great example of that. Okay. And, and uh, I know Paul gives the spiel that I'm talking about, but a, a sort of a practicing lawyer type thought. And, and I guess, Paul, you haven't been going to the courthouse as much, or I mean, you're going to different places in the courthouse than you were before, but you certainly had years and years of, for example, possession of marijuana clients and other types of clients, shoplifting, misdemeanor assaults. If we're talking pure dismissals, that happens a lot more in the misdemeanor world or did back when Paul and I started than it did in the felony world. Um, and uh, Paul, I assume you probably have some sort of spiel when you walk out of the uh, court house with that client and the dismissal, and you have a little sit down talk. Remember, we talked about this would be an expungable disposition. Okay, you got to wait two years, or if it's a felony, three years. And uh, so, what Paul was talking about, and, and I wrote his quote down, was you know, after a dismissal, people go on with their lives and they forget. I kind of make a Big enough deal about it. Plus, I uh, have an awesome assistant. She has some system where she emails them again in a year or two years or something like that. But, um, Paul, have you had uh, people that you gave that spiel to who called you back and, and they were like, oh, I, you know what? I remember you telling me that now, that I should call you in two years. But by now, when they're calling, it's five years later and they need this done yesterday because they, they just put it off. I'm a client. I'm calling you. I'm saying, hey, Paul, thank you so much for getting my case dismissed five years ago. I know you're going to tell me I should have called you earlier. I know you told me at the two-year mark that maybe I should do it, but I'm filling out all these applications or whatever the situation is. How quickly can we get it done, Paul? And not only in court, but then when does it actually happen? Right, right. Yeah, it, <clears throat> this is not something that happens quickly. Um, and in terms of uh, this, having that situation, I mean, people know me as the expunction guy. So, I mean, that's I do criminal defense starting from what's going to be what what is what result can we accept? that's not going to follow this person forever. Uh, so, yeah, they're definitely well aware of what their what, what the effect of their plea is in terms of the, the consequence on their record. Um, but it does, um, what I, one thing I wanted to mention uh, about uh, what Damien was saying about these plea bargains, when people are uh, entering a plea bargain, going in front of the judge and accepting something, we've got to remember that a lot of these people couldn't make bail. A lot of these people, they're, you know, they are, they hear, you sign here, and not only do you get out of jail, but what they hear is it's not going to be on your record if you do this probation. Um, I don't think it's so much, uh, I don't, for most attorneys, I really don't think it's, it's certainly not malicious. Well, uh, I think it's mostly uh, mostly uh, bad communication, not explaining the law very well. Um, but ask your question again, Jamie. I oh, no, I no, no, you got it. 
Uh, hang on a second. I'm talking to, I should just go ahead and give him a shout out. Stephen, another board member is the person I was talking about, and I'm letting him know that, yes, I do see the questions in chat now, and I was in the wrong one again. Uh, that's fine. Yeah, we have a couple uh, of Q&A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 uh, let's, let's hit some Q&A. And yeah, I think you did, uh, right. Oh, I guess, uh, uh, let me ask you this. How common, uh, you were talking about repeating the question, uh, how common is the, gosh, Paul, I know I should have done it at year two, but it's year five. I mean, it, right, I, right. I, the, I, the timing, that's, yeah, that's, that's what I was asking you to remind the, about the timing question. So, yeah, that's that's more than 50% of mine. Fewer than 50% are doing it at two years in one day, I mm -hmm. would say, you know, and I understand that. I, I get it. But just remember that when you really need it, Paul just told you, I can't get it all done tomorrow. I can't get it all done next week. Can't get it all done in a month. If you're talking about, I mean, they you even have to be notified and there's the yeah. time limits and those sorts of things. So, yeah, I think we covered yeah. that. So I would say uh, in terms of uh, the statute, so there are statutory timelines that you just can't get around in terms of, stat well, I want to say a note about statute of limitations. In Travis County, you would probably have pretty good luck at getting the prosecutor to recommend the case for an early expunction. That's the way you get around the statute of limitations problem. Um, in Travis County, it happens very frequently. Uh, your mileage will vary in other counties. Uh, they, I mean, there are other counties that I've requested a recommendation. They look at me like I'm from Mars, um, but so that's so. But in terms of uh, timelines, once you do, even after you do have all the paperwork ready and filed, uh, there's it's usually going to be at least thirty days before you get a hearing, and then the judge is going to sign it. It's going to get filed. Uh, the clerk will probably take you know several weeks to sometimes a month before they send it to all the different agencies, and then it goes on somebody's desk at the agency. And you can imagine at law enforcement agencies and probation departments and you know, uh, different governmental agencies, this is not their highest priority. So unfortunately, the law doesn't put any timeline on how quickly they have to respond to it. So I do know, just because I keep in touch with the lawyers at DPS, uh, they, uh, they are usually at least five or six months backlog. So you got your, your you filed it. You're going to have at least a couple of months before it gets to DPS. And they're going to have probably at least six months before DPS processes it. And DPS, again, is kind of the granddaddy of all the uh, criminal records uh, agencies. And most of the background check companies were purchased from DPS because it's one-stop shopping for the whole state of Texas. So that information very well couldn't may not come off of a background check until DPS does all their stuff and notifies those other agents, the, the uh, private entities, the background check companies, and the background check companies by law have 90 days to update their records. So you're talking a better part of a year before you're 100% sure that you can uh, deny this on, you know, on an application or really anywhere where you're gonna need to pass a background check. So yeah. So, that, so you're happen. telling me even though I need it, I can't get it done tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Well. Keep that in mind, folks. Okay, we've got some good questions in the chat. I'm going to start with the first one from Debbie. My son is in state jail for six months for a state jail felony. His sentence is over next Thursday. He is only 22 years old and now has a felony record. So what can he do to clear his record or is he doomed forever? And Debbie, if it wasn't you, I actually remember, I thought it might have been a Debbie, uh, a mother of somebody at the last Ask a Lawyer that we had on Zoom who had said, my son was offered five years of state jail felony probation, but he decided to take the six months, which is the minimum state jail if they keep it in that range, uh, because the five or six months, uh, I'm sorry, the five years of probation uh, would likely lead to an even more higher than minimum sentence. So, you know, why do three or four years of probation and then, uh, you know, potentially get revoked and do the full two years anyway, get it over with and do a little bit now? Um, and if, if you weren't the person that asked that, um, just know that there are other people that are in that situation. Well, whether you were the one that asked that or not, and I always start by saying, I'm sorry that we're still at a place in society that uh, we are forcing very young adults. I guess I'm not, you know, we're forcing our own children to make decisions like this. 
You know, I, I, I regret that this sort of question has to be asked. Unfortunately, I don't think he's doomed forever because I don't think the inability to seal or expunge his record is necessarily uh, a doomed forever, but th yeah, you're I'll, right. Let me make a point about that. So, uh, so yeah, unfortunately, Debbie, I'm, I'm, I'm real sorry. Unfortunately, I, I chose a job where I got to get bad news a lot of times. Um, under the law as it stands right now, there's not anything you can do to take that off his record. Now, I want to uh, encourage everybody to look at this, write down this website and go to it, uh, cleanslatetexas.org. Uh, so the Clean Slate Coalition is a group of activists and um, lobbyists and different people who will, uh, we basically we pr propose legislation every time the legislature meets every two years to make it, make the eligibility more expensive, make more people eligible for these things. And the, the trend is that more people, every legislative session, more people do become eligible. It's kind of baby steps. But the reason I'm saying go to that website is it'll, there's a, a, a if you click on the get involved, there is a tool that will tell you who all your state representatives are that uh, you can contact about these, about and to just explain to them, you know, what people are going through uh, out here. And uh, and the other thing is you can sign up for their their uh, newsletter, and it will give you uh, just updates on what what the process is, uh, which laws have passed, and everything. So one of the pieces of legislation that we have proposed is to make people eligible to at least seal felony, state jail felony uh, records. So, uh, and, and pretty much every, I can't think of a violent state jail felony. Uh, can you, Jamie? Uh, yeah. If you're talking uh, for immigration purposes, I, I burglary of a building, but maybe not, that would be, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's not. Uh, I was, the only reason I'm saying anything about violence is, is that there's all there's always a carve out or an additional waiting period or something right, right. For, for violent offenses. Right. But Debbie, what I want to tell you is I really feel like there is uh, there is reason to be encouraged about that. Um, so I feel like we're definitely going to get something. Well, I shouldn't say definitely. I mean, the legislature has got a lot of, uh, you know, stomping on women's rights and uh, shaming and jailing trans kids parents to do but i feel like there's a good good bit of a good chance that we can get this done and if you go to the clean slate texas.org um you can tell your story to these legislators and that's really what i mean i could lobby to them you know all day long uh but the, when they hear the story they see the faces behind the cases uh that's the kind of thing that's going to get these laws changed Absolutely. And we are essentially uh, an organization that helps Texans, to, I'm talking about Texas Normal, uh, get to the Capitol. We have lobby days for you to come and tell your personal stories. You can interact with us uh, ahead of time. We will figure out zip codes, where you're from, who's your personal representative, because it doesn't do any good for Jamie from Austin to go into the Amarillo uh, represent. I mean, his his or her office is right there at the Texas Capitol in Austin, but they don't want to hear from me. And so people have been coming for every two years uh, regularly now. We we have these lobby days, and the best things are the personal stories of 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 this happened to me. This happened to my son. So yes, Debbie, I did want to say I I think that uh, you know there I don't consider it doomed, but obviously there's no remedy right now. All right, so we're probably going to go till uh, not a whole bunch more than nine o'clock, but we do have another couple of questions. And I like all of these. I'm going I to can, have. Can I ask one question real quick? I saw in the in the Q and A. Yes. Uh, I saw that uh, Jax had said uh, she can can uh, participants. Or, Jax, can, Jax, Jax is not. Can we give Jax the floor? Because whenever I can I, give Jax the floor, I do that. I saw that too, Stephen. I believe that Jax is not here. Uh, I don't know if Stephen could pop in. Not, that's a, not that I'm aware of. Right. That's a that's a thing where Stephen's helping do some stuff that Jax would do and popped up and stuff. I hear exactly what you're saying. I so, did, not, did not ever <laughs> want to miss an opportunity here from Jax. Hundred percent. And she will probably be at the next meeting for Jax fans. So please tune in the next uh, the first Wednesday of the next month. All right. Um, 
Now, I don't know how good a job I'm going to do on this one, but let me read this from Anonymous. And you're welcome to put it in as Anonymous. There's no reason you have to give us your names if you don't want to. I am under the care of a pain doctor who prescribes my morphine for my chronic back pain. I wanted to start the compassionate use program to weed off morphine and replace with cannabis, but I cannot find a pain doctor who will work with me. And when I'm drug tested at a pain doctor, I'm shown to be using marijuana, even if it's only CBD. Is it legal for a doctor to not work with someone who's accepted in the compassionate use program like they have with me? That's at least two questions. I'm gonna to try to separate those out and then I'm gonna uh, let Paul comment as well. Um, one thing is, I know that you know that you're taking legal THC, but um, the way drug tests are measured now, they're not necessarily going to be able to tell the legal THC from the illegal THC. And I, by the way, I don't think any of what I'm about to say is fair. Very much what Paul said about, you know, I, I, I answer the questions that come up. It doesn't mean that we're not working on these issues. We are. But you basically never going to be able to prove that you were taking your legal THC and not also smoking evil, bad, deadly, illegal marijuana THC. Very much the similar situation that people ask about probation when they say, uh, you know, I, I'm on legal THC on probation and it's coming up as illegal THC. You know, this is a this is a huge problem. This is absolutely a problem that needs solving. And we're not really that we're aware. Some people are aware of it. Um, people who care about other people not getting uh, overly harmed by draconian drug laws uh, care about these sorts of things. So maybe we're moving in the right direction. But in the same way, I cert I have not read any free law in Texas, but I don't know of a law that 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 uh, would prevent a doctor, a medical doctor, from saying, um, "I personally don't think uh, legal THC is any good. I recommend all of my clients don't take it, and if they do." I won't work with them because they're not on my regimen. I'm, I've got the Spencer regimen. This is what you're supposed to do. You eat these things. You don't smoke these things. That's fine. You don't have to be my patient. But no, I don't think that they're... Now, can you maybe find better doctors? I, and I don't know where you are. The answer is I hope so. But yes, this is still still a problem. Paul, do you have uh, comments on that? No, I was, that's what I was going to say. I mean, you don't want to work with a doctor who is, has any qualms about working with you if you're in a compassionate use program. So, I mean, that is a red flag waving a red flag. Uh, yeah, get get another doctor because anybody is going to be better than somebody who doesn't, who's not going to take your, what you feel, take seriously what you feel like your best course of action is for your own Although I'll throw this out there. Paul and I live very close to each other. And sometimes we forget that there are 253 other counties in Texas. So, uh, I mean, you know, there, there could easily be counties where it's really hard to find a doctor that's even educated at this point on these things. Because if they're in the sort of county that's super harsh in the first place, you know, he's one of the, he may have voted for the, legislators that we're trying to replace so we can get good laws. So, all right. Um, so John Larkin on Facebook, hey, I got pulled over with under one ounce of herb. And this is great because it's kind of, uh, this one kind of comes back to our topic. I got pulled over with under one ounce of herb in Bell County. I went to the prosecutor and they offered me to drop the case if I did 10 hours of community service in 30 days. I did it and they dropped the case. So first off, I'm just going to stop your question and say, I'm dead serious. Thank you for Bell County. Uh, I practice mostly in Travis, but also surrounding counties. I don't actually have that much experience in Bell, but Williamson County, Hayes County, and those sorts of things. Some of them have gotten much better. Uh, I don't think, I think that would have been a surprising resolution even five years ago in Bell County, especially, it sounds like if you were pro se. But you are in that category that we were talking about. If this was a dismissal dismissal where you didn't have a probation officer, you didn't go in front of the judge and he didn't say that he had enough to find you guilty. I mean, I believe that's part of your question. Um, then I think you're going to be eligible for an expunction. I also later that year had to do a background check for a place to live and it popped up in my background check. Uh, I just type in my name in Bell County and uh, Google and it pops up. 
can I get this erased? I got the rent house, but I just do not want it to pop up anywhere. What can I do? Please help. Love, Norm. Love y'all. Thank you for being here, Norm. Thank you for the question. And uh, people aren't required to stay on topic, but boy, howdy to you. Um, right. I'm going to just assume, Paul, just for the sake of it, I'm going to throw in one more that is a hypothetical and say that his arrest was six months ago and that he got the dismissal uh, three months ago. Um, and uh, the, the arrest was nine months ago. The, how about that? Something in that range. So uh, what is John looking at in terms so, of... In terms of being able to get it off his record? Yeah, okay. So there is a... Part of the analysis of, deter, of uh, what, uh, what time counts for the statute of limitations is that the time that the case is pending, so from the time they indict you to the time the case is dismissed, that doesn't count towards the statute of limitations. So when I'm talking about three years for a felony, I'm not talking about like from the date of the offense. Statute of limitations is usually, when people talk about that, they're talking about it runs from the date of the offense and then after, for example, three years, the state can't charge you anymore. Well, on the flip side, on an expunction, you, it, does, it runs from the date of the offense, but once the, they indict you or formally charge you with the offense, the statute of limitations stops running and it doesn't start running again until you get the case dismissed and then, and then it starts again. So I usually calculate, because it doesn't take very long to charge somebody uh, from the date of the offense to the indictment or I mean, on a misdemeanor, it's called an information and they just, they just file that and doesn't even go to a grand jury. Um, on those things, uh, the, uh, the, the better way to calculate the statute of limitations is basically from the date of dismissal. So it's going to be- I agree totally, by the way, because at least let's talk about Travis when we were practicing in the 2000s, Paul. I mean, for the most part, in information, they, they did, I think this changed in the 2010s just from a flood of cases, more arrest standpoint. But I mean, it was pretty common that an information might be filed within two to four weeks of when my client was arrested, you know, something like that. So technically, let's say it takes them three weeks to file this piece of paper that Paul's talking about for misdemeanor marijuana. Again, that's called an information. And he told you the felony uh, charging instrument is called an indictment. Indictment sounds scary. It's a piece of paper. There's, there's something called a notice requirement. Yes, you know what he confiscated. Yes, you heard him when he gave you to the sheriff's office and said, I'm booking him for possession of marijuana. But there's a formal way that the state has to charge you uh, and write down on a piece of paper, put it in the clerk's file, and it affects jury trial. Then they, this is exactly what we intend to prove. And then, like, if they, I mean, it might sound silly. I don't want to go too far off on this. But on an indictment, if they said, we're going to prove he, he possessed cocaine, and they pr prove that my client possessed heroin, they're going to lose that. So they got to write down what it is. This is just a cookie cutter template, though. They literally have a program where somebody says, well, here's all the, the arrestees names and they can just throw those names into those word documents or whatever it is that they're using to prepare these things. So if my client is arrested and then it takes them three weeks to uh, file that information. And then it takes me one year or four years to get that case dismissed. And we just keep going to court and it's never dismissed. And finally, you know, it's dismissed. Well, the mathematical technical answer is you have to wait two years minus three weeks. But again, if that time period is so small, in some ways, you could just think of exactly how Paul said it. That's how I explain it to people. It's essentially the statute of limitations length starting at the time of dismissal. Hopefully that made uh, some sense. Um, oh, yeah, let me say real quick about the, the question about uh, searching Google and your name coming up on that, because the expunction or the non-disclosure, it goes to the different state agencies, and then DPS notifies the background check companies. Um, that is not going to take it off of Google. Nothing, nothing, ever, nothing ever really comes off the internet. The internet archive, it's archived, uh, you know, uh, pretty much if, if it was ever on the internet, it can be found. Um, but if you do have an expunction or non-disclosure, one of the benefits that that gives you is that if you, you can send a certified copy of the judge's order, and there are Texas laws that protect you about them continuing to publish that information. Um, there, and I, and I want to jump. 
Mm -hmm. Go go ahead, Paul. I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to say I want to jump in, and I realized that one of the ways that I could have introduced you, uh, but I'm going to I'm going to add it now is yeah, there's a list of of uh, private entities, and uh, to be truthful, I assume Paul knows this, but around here we call it Paul Quincy's list. <laughs> and if somebody calls me and says, "Hey, do you have the list? I need it." I, I'm a, you know I'm like, well, I got this one from Paul Quincy, but you know that was a year ago or whatever. You might want to check with him again. So. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. That is a uh, that's an important part of all this. Uh, anything else on that before I, I jump to another? Okay, are there things someone should say or not say if question regarding uh, an initial approach from law enforcement for possession? So the uh, shortest answer to this is that you should, uh, and this is legal plus practical advice. He's the one with the gun. He's the one standing at your car that you pulled over. He's the one that's saying I can smell marijuana. And he's not, you're not going to talk him out of thinking that he does smell it. I mean, I'm making up the hypothetical here, right? But this is how it typically works is they pull somebody over for speeding, traffic violation. They start saying, hey, I got some marijuana stank here. What's going on? And then that's going to give them legal cause to get you out of, I mean, they might offer you the opportunity to just give it up. Uh, there's not a one size fits all here because defense lawyers usually are very much, don't say anything to the cops, don't say anything to the cops. But when, for example, Austin was the first city to do site release where they would not always take you to jail for marijuana. Sometimes they would hand you a ticket, let you go on your way that night, but you'd still face the same penalty later, but you just didn't have to take the ride to the station. You didn't have to sit in jail for 12 to 24 hours. You didn't have to pay a bail bondsman or who or wait for pretrial to let you out. So it's definitely better. But my experience was that the that the folks that went to jail were the ones that the cops thought failed the attitude test. At that time, there was no prohibition from them using funds in that way. I mean, they were extremely progressive at the time. I want to say 2007, Paul, if that sounds right, or, you know, somewhere around there when, when we finally, I think that was when it was first implemented. But at any rate, um, yeah, polite, cooperative. And I mean, if it seems like he's going to search your person or your car, there's not a ton you're going to be able to do. In a jurisdiction, well, I mean, again, in Austin, it just barely matters. Uh, but, you know, there may be other jurisdictions out there, too, where if a cop says, hey, I can just, if you just tell me where it is, I'll confiscate it and write you a ticket tonight. But uh, if not, I'm going to take 30 minutes and search your car, and then I'm going to take you to jail. I mean, they don't necessarily always say it that way, but pretty close. You know, I would seriously consider saying, okay, you got me, because... Uh, most of these things in terms of he didn't do something properly is going to have to be litigated by your lawyer later. You're just not going to be able to do it out there on the street. So uh, I don't know how much that answers your question. Do you, do you have some additional comments, Paul? Um, I, I tend to agree with that in terms of like here in Travis County, because I've just heard enough times where, you know, if you're polite, you give it up, especially now they know it's not going to get not going to get charged. So like if, now DPS will still charge you with it. DPS will still either give you a site and release or arrest you. Um, the prosecutors will, uh, they'll reject the charges, but you still may, you still may get arrested by like DPS. So in Travis County, I would say, and, and I mean, the, the question assumes, I, I guess I'm, I'm, when I hear the question, I'm, I'm assuming small personal amount. Right, 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 okay. right. So if you don't have any knowledge of the and you have a dugout, then be cool. If they ask you, give it up. They will take your dugout, bummer, but you're not going to jail or going to get cited for the most part. And everywhere else in Texas, I would say two words, silence, lawyer. So, uh, uh, and it also depends on what else you're into also, because, you know, when, once they do find something they can arrest you for, they're going to do what they call an inventory search, and they're going to find anything else to get. Right. But I agree with Paul. There is no circumstance under which I would admit knowing about that kilo of whatever it was in the trunk. 
remember the part where he was talking about we're assuming that this is a you know a small example not something big uh yeah politeness isn't going to help you there and uh, i sort of should have said this i also semi-combined in my answer the next question which is what is the best way to deal with a law enforcement officer who wants to search your car so we're at 855 i'm going to move on and uh so I think I can I can uh, combine these two questions. If there is not enough to test an abate pen, can the state still prosecute since an element of the crime is less than 0.3%? And are there any CBD isolates that won't pop a UA for probation? First, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take them in reverse order. Uh, I have heard all sorts of methods for beating UAs. Uh, when I was 19, I worked at a place called Fat Burger, where there was a truck driver, part-time truck driver. He owned the cab, and sometimes he got contract work, and he smoked marijuana all the time, and he was a part-time cook there. He was a friend of the owner, and um, I mean, I've actually heard this since. It's the first time I'd ever heard of this. One day I come in, and if you've worked in a in the fast food, food service industry, those sorts of things. You've seen those big green plastic barrels of pickles. Well, there's a lot of pickle juice in them. And my buddy's over there just drinking pickle juice. He swore by it. He said, listen, I've got this contract now to you know drive this truck in a week and I have to pay, I, I have to pass a UA. Um, and uh, it works great for me. Uh, I've heard people, I've had people who said it failed miserably for them. So in terms of, you know, predicting for you what, you know, tests are. Uh, I, yeah, I, I just have to kind of pass on that. And then in terms of the, the you know, vape pen and the 0.3%, the issue is, uh, well, first off, the, the, just the straight out answer is absolutely yes, people get prosecuted for vape pens, especially in places that aren't Travis County. Um, and, it is somewhat still a question as to, I mean, I don't know of an appellate case yet where uh, we've kind of gone over this, how much does this case have to prove that it's not actually from legal hemp? Uh, and uh, I, I mean, I might be behind on that, but uh, at the end of the day, you're still in that sort of situation where at a bare minimum, you know, even if you beat the rap, you can't beat the ride. Uh, and they certainly don't have to prove out there on the street what the percentage is, right? Yeah. Um, and yes, criminal defense lawyers have used this to push back against unreasonable places, you know, other than Travis County. And it is a, it's a great thing in our favor. It, it, but, but the question isn't, was yours actually 0.3%? It's, hey, it's going to be too difficult for you. And I know that DPS was asking for money to get machines to be able to tell the difference. And there's some inner po politics about how you know, there are district attorney's offices that are actually very harsh that really kind of want this hemp issue to make it go away so that they don't have to deal with THC cases anymore. And they certainly don't like dealing with lawyers like me and Paul that keep asking them, yeah, well, you're giving me the same crummy deal. You're giving me the same crummy felony deferred adjudication deal you give everybody else. And even you're admitting you've got a lot of problems in this case. How about a misdemeanor instead of a felony or, or whatever the situation might be, right? Whatever the, the you think the most reasonable and low outcome that they can go. Um, Paul, uh, 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 any thoughts or I can go uh, just a little bit. Just, uh, uh, real, real quick note about just the element of the crime being that it's uh, greater than 3% THC. Um, what you're talking about is proof. What do they have to right. prove? It doesn't matter what I believe. It only matters what I can prove. Well, we've all heard you're innocent unless proven guilty in a court of law beyond a reasonable doubt. That only applies in a trial. That does not apply to a cop. It does not apply to a prosecutor. In my experience, it is not human nature to give somebody the benefit of the doubt. I mean, it, I, I struggle with it myself on occasion. Um, well, to be fair, Not Paul, so much when we're dealing with unjust laws, but what I'm saying is, is that in terms of you, like, like uh, Jamie says, you can beat the rap, but you can't beat the ride. The only time you're ever gonna have an opportunity to put them to their proof that there, that there was a reasonable doubt that it was less than 3% is gonna be in a trial. And that's, that carries with it, you know, a good, a good bit of risk. 
and um, and so uh, so just for your just for your own safety, um, yeah, do not. And, and again, here they're not gonna you're not gonna uh, get a charge for it. Uh, my understanding is uh, Harris County is out liberaling us in uh, in terms of dope cases. Sometimes um, I'm not sure if they're charging those cases anymore. Maybe some of the other larger municipalities. Anywhere else in the state of Texas, um, you should not assume that um, you're not going to be charged and possibly convicted um, if you have any any of any of eight pen with even a trace amount. All right. So uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. I know there were a few questions that we didn't get to. Please come back to other meetings. We'll try to, to, to do better. I really appreciate the fact that uh, Paul came and helped me out here tonight. I always have a ton of fun on the Ask a Lawyer nights. Um, we uh, want you to, uh, you know, Paul's talking about websites. You can come take a look at us online as well. Uh, I recommended our YouTube channel, which is really, we've been, uh, I want to say thank you to Stephen again for running this stuff in the background, because as you can tell, I have trouble even knowing when it's okay to break in <laughs> when somebody's still talking uh, based on a delay. So it's super helpful to have that. So I appreciate you being here, Stephen, as well. Uh, helping this meeting run smoothly. Uh, our next first Wednesday is going to be September 5th is a Wednesday. We're going to have a, uh, it'll be folks that aren't lawyers. Oh, and back to bragging about the YouTube channel. Uh, it's by no means is it all lawyers. It's a bunch of our meetings. There's uh, medical professionals. You can learn things about health and marijuana. We've got scientists that we have some really interesting panels about the science behind uh, marijuana, why it works the way that it does in terms of it being a healing medicine and those sorts of things. Uh, I, I know that a lot of our members find those sorts of things interesting, uh, and uh, we appreciate all the support that we have. Uh, and uh, again, thank you to Paul and everybody have a good time. Thank you very much. Real, real, real oh, quick, oh, yeah. uh, if, you have a, a, if you have an arrest record in Travis County, and you want to know if it's something that you can get off your off your record? You're already paying for me with your tax dollars now that I work at the library. So please uh, call the law library. Uh, number is five one two eight five four eight six seven seven. My direct line is five one two eight five four sixteen thirty one. Um, just Google Travis County Law Library. We'll work it out. Thanks here for having me. And anybody who's watching on YouTube, you can just hit rewind and write the number down. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, we will see you next month. Good night.